Well, that was fun. <laughs> well, at least we know what we're saying now. Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad, and to my right we have... Benjamin B. <sighs> this is really tough because Ben and I literally were just recording for probably 20 minutes and... Well, technically we weren't recording. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I forgot to press record, so... Here we are doing this again. First things first, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. Whether it's on the podcast app, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, it doesn't matter. We are everywhere. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching on YouTube. If in fact this content does bring you value, you can always share it with somebody. And in the end, if you want to reach out to us, you can always email us, Tom at realrecoverytalk.com and Ben at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, what we want to do is help you turn your mess into your message. That, Ben, you're getting good. See, cheer up, Tom. It's not that bad. We, we might have to do the same thing over again. However, I think we're nailing it. Yeah, we're doing good. We're on the right trajectory. So how's it been? Good. What are we talking about today, Tom? All right. So Ben and I have been... um afforded this opportunity to work in treatment now for some years, probably uh, 10 years or more. And, um, you know, we get asked quite a bit recently, too, of how we even got involved in this. And uh, Ben and I thought, well, hey, this would be a good topic to discuss on the podcast and, uh, you know, really shed some light on um, how we got involved in this field and kind of the things that we see uh, now moving forward and, you know, maybe a little bit about what we want to do with this moving forward. So, yeah, that's that's what I think we're going to talk about. Yeah, no, in particular, this last couple of weeks, it's, it's funny how things just come up over and over again in a pattern. But uh, I've gotten a couple phone calls from mothers and going back and forth in text messages, and they've been asking, like, Ben, how did you get into the field? My son is in treatment right now and saying that they, they want to do what you do. How did you get to where you're at? I hope that they can be like you one day, you know, et cetera. Um, but kind of, I thought this was a really good opportunity because I was in speaking with those mothers, I was basically like, let's pump the brakes. There's a, a proper way to get involved with this. And in my opinion, an improper way to get involved with this as well. Um, and Tom and I thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of share our personal experience with, you know, how we got into the field. Um, for me, it was not necessarily planned, if you will. I think just one small opportunity came after another, but it was very slowly progressive, so to speak. But um, one of the things, like Tom was saying, you know, a lot of times we have clients coming into rock and they're three weeks, 30 days into treatment. And all of a sudden they're like, Oh, we want to do what you do, or we want to be therapists. And, you know, you, again, like we'll get into our opinion with the right way to get into this and, and not one of the things that I'll just call it what it is. There are some, some treatment centers are better than others. Morally, ethically, the way that they operate, et cetera, the services they provide, it just kind of is what it is. I'll be transparent about that. But for instance, the treatment center that I very first worked for required two years of sobriety for you to be able to work there. Um, I remember I, I had like, I was a month and a half away from having two years and the lady said to me, you sound like a great candidate. Call me back when you have two years. And literally, like I called back the day of. But that, you know, there are some centers out there and I've seen this or somebody will lie and say that they have more sobriety time than they do. Um, but you get into this too soon, like we'll see people get start working at a detox or a PHP with like 90 days of sobriety. And maybe you want to touch on that, Tom, like why in this in this, I think it's important to have some solid sobriety under your belt before getting into this field. And I see people take shortcuts and yeah, it backfires. Well, it's, it, it really is irritating. And I had the same situation. I, when I first got involved in working in treatment, um, 
I, I just knew I didn't want to go back to working on cars, you know, and it was uh, something that I had taken a liking to, but, you know, obviously none of us have crystal balls. I didn't know that I was going to be the, in the position that I'm in today, but <clears throat> looking back on it, you know, everything kind of fell in line the way that it was supposed to. Now, I was collecting unemployment for a while and um, really had an opportunity to focus on my sobriety. You know, I didn't work for, and I'll say this, I, I didn't work for the first year of my sobriety. And that's not something that I would normally suggest to people. Um, but, you know, I was in the position, I was financially okay, I was able to, I still had money, and I still had a, a, an income of sorts. Um, but I really took that first year and focused strictly on my sobriety. When I got a year, somebody had suggested to me, you know, hey, maybe you do want to look into working in, in the treatment field. And, and I was and I had been thinking about it at that point. And I said, Yeah, you know, man, whatever. So I remember I had, um, I had three interviews in one day, I had an interview at a treatment, I had, I had an interview at two treatment centers. And then I had an interview at Publix all in the same day. One of the treatment centers was in Delray, Florida, I was living in West Palm, um, the other treatment center was in West Palm and then there was Publix and, um, both treatment centers offered me a job. Publix didn't even call me back. Um, and I took one of the jobs and I started off as an entry level, an entry level position, which was a, you know, behavioral health tech. Um, and I say entry level there, that is not by any means, like behavioral health technician in the treatment space is one of, if not the hardest job there is, because you are on the front lines is kind of what we say. You're with the clients all the time. And where I get frustrated with this is that that was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. It has morphed into now, really, we don't even ask about your sobriety time. And that's the unfortunate thing. A lot of treatment centers don't even ask why I don't know. Chances are if somebody's coming into your treatment center and interviewing for a behavioral health technician, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that they are in recovery. Now, how long are they in recovery is something that we don't know, but I think it is something that we need to know. And the reason I say this is because whether you are a behavioral health tech, a janitor, a therapist, one of the cooks, a driver, doesn't matter. You are at some point in time going to be in a position to have to be a, a light for them. You have to, you have to, you're going to have to be encouraging to them. They're going to come to you with an issue. They're going to want your advice on something and you have to be able, you need to be in a position to be able to give them sound advice, to give them, you know, the information that they need based off of your experiences. And if you don't have those experiences in my position, you don't have any right to be in a position of working in a treatment center. So it's, it's, I don't question the motives behind people wanting to work in treatment. I do question the motives of the facilities that are willing to hire somebody knowing that they have 60 or 90 days clean. Like what in your mind makes you think that this is a good idea, hiring somebody that has three months of sobriety. Well, one thing to keep in mind with that being said, you know, in early recovery, 60, 90 days in the first year, you're really still growing as a person. You're still becoming a better person. In many ways, where I can speak for myself, my behavior 
was still not the best. And one thing to keep in mind is like by working in treatment, we are surrounded with quote unquote sickness. Like it's really easy to when you're surrounded, like say I do a group and I'm surrounded by 15 clients and for a poor way to put it, you know, some of them act like they're 12 years old, you know, burping and being inappropriate. And, (laughs) you know, we see it all. Don't get me wrong. We've got plenty of mature people here as well. Um, But that stuff is there and it's very easy to, to get sucked into that. And if you're brand new in recovery, you're more likely to get sucked in and emulate their behavior versus becoming a beacon of what somebody should be behaving like. Like, and that that's our responsibility to be an inspiration and be held to a higher standard, so to speak. And if you haven't had the practice doing that and haven't been living that lifestyle, in my opinion, you really shouldn't be working in treatment yet. Yeah, it's 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 asinine, really. If you if you really think about it, it's um, let's 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 break it down into more simplistic for for people. Okay, let's say you're listening to this podcast and you got some weight that you need to lose. Maybe you got a you know thirty forty pounds. You know it's new year, new me. I need to lose this weight, and you know I'm gonna hire hire a trainer or, you know, somebody to help me with my nutrition, stuff like that. And you have two options. Those options are myself, who, and I know, and Ben can attest to this, I know so much about nutrition that I can, I can dial it in on with somebody, probably get relatively close. If I know what their goals are, I can probably get pretty close uh, and get you there. Um, I have a hard time practicing it myself. When it comes to diet and nutrition, it's always been one of my biggest struggles. Why? I don't know. To be honest, I have no idea. Um, So, you know, for me, it's a struggle. Therefore, I don't feel like I'm in a position to be able to give somebody advice nor would I even feel comfortable somebody asking me advice or if I if they come and ask me for advice, I always tell them, I can give you my suggestions. Keep in mind, though, I have a hard time practicing it myself. Now, I'm option A. I'm over here. I'm option A. Option B is Ben. Ben is somebody that he has a goal. He hires a coach who he has a coach that we know who knows suit like far more than I do. His coach gives him what he needs and Ben can follow it to a T and get the results that he needs. And you can go to Ben and ask Ben, Hey, these are what now Ben's goals. And some of you probably know Ben's training for a bodybuilding show. That involves a lot of work. Um, And from his coach's perspective, I, you know, obviously I'm not a coach and I, I can't, you know, say this with complete confidence, but it's a lot of work on his end. Somebody asking Ben for advice or to be their coach, probably not the same caliber. Let's just say you're that person that wants to lose 30 or 40 pounds. Who are you going to feel more comfortable going to with it and getting getting guidance from getting advice from myself? Who, you know, I, 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 you know, if you're watching below the table, I have a belly. I do. I have a belly. I have muscle. I can lift a lot of weight. My traps, I think, are coming in rather nicely. What do you think? Your, your traps look nice. Yeah. Or you could you could pick somebody like Ben, who obviously you can look at and know, okay, this guy follows and he practices what he's preaching, so on and so forth. You're obviously going to pick somebody like Ben. That's the most simplistic way that I can put it. If you're going to seek out 
if you're if you're in a position to where you need advice or you need help or you need guidance from somebody, you want that you want that person to be somebody that can practice what they're preaching. And unfortunately, in some treatment centers now, it has gotten away from that. You know, I I would not entrust, you know, if I fast forward you know, 20 years and my son needs to be in treatment or my daughter, I want him or her to be surrounded by people that are sober, not just clean. I want them to be sober. I want them to be emulating what sobriety is all about. I want them to live the life of recovery. I want them to have all of these principles in their lives today. And I want them to, I want them to have been living this life for at minimum a year, you know, or even longer. I'll bring my sponsor into it. My sponsor said to me one time, he's like, Ben, don't find somebody that can tell you what the big book and recovery is about. Find somebody that can tell you about their experience with it. There's a difference between having the knowledge and having the application. And we talk about that on the podcast all the time. We have clients that have been to several treatment centers before coming to Rock. They've sat in groups, they've had therapists, they know the different types of therapy. All that knowledge is there where they're falling short is the application. You know, going back to the the trainer analogy, like in its simplest form, if I'm going to choose a, a personal trainer, I was at the gym with Whitney the other day, and there was a couple that just bought a, a gym membership clearly that day, and arguably the people on their first day were in better shape than the trainer was. And I'm just, you know... Not to knock on them, but like, are they living that lifestyle? Are they going to inspire somebody? Well, it's like getting a marriage those? counselor that's got gotten divorced twice. Exactly. I was going to say that one too earlier. <laughs> you know, <it's... laughs> but, you know, with all that being said, I think us breaking down, Tom, you gave a little bit of a breakdown of how you got into treatment um, a year Well, yeah. And what ultimately, so I started off as a behavioral health tech and learned so much. And I did that for, uh, well, at the first facility I was at, I I went from just, you know, behavioral health tech. And then after six months or a few months rather, um, moved into more the lead tech position. So now I was in charge of scheduling and, you know, making sure that the techs were doing their jobs the right way. And, And then from there, I went to another facility and I went to um, Palm Beach State College where Ben and I met and started taking their addictions classes because by at that point I had, you know, a year and a half coming up on two years of sobriety. And I pretty much knew at that point, this is okay. This is kind of what I'm going to be doing. Um, I did enjoy it. I could tell that the clients that I had worked with up to that point, like, I had a special thing. Um, I was able to communicate with them well. I was able to relate to them on many different levels. They were able to listen to me. I was, I'm very good at um, portraying or being an authority figure, but also like that friend that's going to come alongside you simultaneously. If I'm not mistaken, I heard through the grapevine you had a nickname. Trooper Tom. Trooper Tom. Yeah. Where'd you hear that from? I, I think Jennifer. No, it wouldn't have been Jennifer because I, I got that nickname when I worked at Palm Beach Institute hmm. because I had a pair of aviators ah. and I wore around everywhere. So, they yeah, they called me Trooper Tom. Yeah, but kind of like what Tom is saying, for me, that translates to Tom had good boundaries. He could be an authority figure, yeah. but at the same time, have a solid rapport with the clients. And that's a fine line to walk. Because somebody in early recovery, they try to build rapport, but to build rapport, they start behaving more like the client. Yeah. And let's just call it what it is. What I've witnessed is we, we've we seen this. We've had clients that have left Rock and got accepted to work at a treatment center. And a couple months later, they're back in treatment themselves. It's you, There's just not a solid foundation there. Um, so like I, I'll, I'll share my experience with it. For me, mine was more the the typical, I didn't work in treatment for the first two years of my sobriety. I actually worked for a moving company uh, called Grable Van Lines. And I got to tell you, like it was while I hated that job and it was hard work, 
you know, I was uh did all the uh the inventory system for the warehouse, but that also involved a ton of physical labor as well with emptying tractor trailers. Like we'd have to empty three or four tractor trailers with like two hundred vanities that weigh two hundred pounds a piece with forklifts and you know, and these things sweating in the middle of summer. There were like 120 degrees inside of them. That job was rough, but it also I'm really glad that I did it because I'll, I'll throw it out there. My first two years of sobriety, I think I already said this, but my behavior was not necessarily the best. You know, I was I was still in many ways kind of dry until my sobriety grew into what it is today. But for instance, you know, I was constantly getting written up, constantly near fired. And it wasn't that my quality of work wasn't good because I was really good at the job. But I always had a, a, I always had to have words with the boss. I knew how to do the job better than the boss. And it, like, you know, a, a, a arrogance, if you will. You know, I went into this, this job at a moving company. And in my mind, I should be running the place. But what I ended up finding out is being the boss is really hard. I had no idea what that guy actually did. Like, and I mean, I'm because he did a good job. Like I realize now until you're in that position, you don't realize what the position entails. But so over the course of time, like in that first two years, I learned a lot about myself and my communication skills weren't the best. You know, I, I was abrasive. I was constantly getting into arguments. You know, there was a lot, had I just started into a treatment center, Imagine if I behaved that way with the HR department, you know, like it's, I, I was that guy at the warehouse that was always being called into the office or something. Ben, if you didn't do such good work, you'd be freaking fired. Right. And I, w I was on thin ice. And, um, by the end of that two years, my, uh, operations manager and I, that I worked with him and I always were button heads for like probably a year and a half that I worked there. And towards the end, like I started to change, you know, and it got to the point where he would like come at the end and, and like thank me. Hey, Ben, you're the only employee that came and checked out with me today before you left the building, you know, stuff like that. Little things like that mattered that helped my character grow. But with that being said, like Tom said, um, I had been there for two years and I went and applied. I wanted to go back to school. I already had my associate's degree that somehow I got an active addiction. It's, it was bad. I could go into some stories with that one showing up in my work clothes from the night before Oh yeah. sat next to a police officer in my, uh, one of my English classes. And I'm like just reeking of alcohol with like cocaine boogers. And <laughs> like I'd been up all night sitting next to this guy. But, um, anyway, so I got enrolled in the addictions program at Palm beach state. And it's funny cause the very first class we had to do where I met Tom introduction to human services, we had to do a report on like a human services business, if you will, or operation. So I chose a spot called unity treatment center. I researched it online and we present it to the class, like what they do there. So in my mind, I was like, well, Hey, I, uh, I already know everything about this treatment center. I've studied their website and their services. So I called them and I told the, told the lady, the HR lady that did the hiring. I'm like, hey, I actually had to do a project on you guys. Figured I might as well uh, see if you're hiring. And it was kind of cool. Like she, she appreciated that. But going back to what I was saying earlier, I was about a month and a half away from having two years of sobriety. And she firmly said, call me back when you have two years. I called the day of. She said, and she remembered me from the conversation and said, come on in for an interview. Now you got two years. And I want to touch on that real quick too, because there, I find it moral and ethical. There are uh, equal opportunity laws. Technically speaking, there's a law against not hiring somebody with less sobriety, but let's just call it what it is. I personally don't care about the law in that aspect. Like these are people's lives. You know, I do believe treatment centers should require a certain amount of clean time for people in recovery because you are protecting vulnerable adults, so to speak. Hang on, but, pause, pause. This battery is about to die. So we got a few minutes left. Come on. That's it? All right. So I'm not going to be able to finish this time. Come on. So I end up, now you threw me off. I get this job at Unity, and like Tom, I started as a behavioral health tech. 
became a lead, became a supervisor, became a manager. Um, and that was over the course of about four and a half years working for this same treatment center. One day, due to some behind the scenes stuff, the treatment center closed. They were struggling financially because the insurance changed some of their rules and whatnot. But um, the very next day, I got a, a call from somebody that wanted help opening a treatment center, which I had never done before, didn't really have the experience, but they figured I had enough knowledge to be helpful. And so for me, like another opportunity opened, you know, I learned about the licensing and all that stuff on the back end, helped, helped open this treatment center year and a half later after that, you know, I, I was kind of done with that place. Um, to be a hundred percent honest, it went in a direction that I didn't fully agree with from a moral and ethical standpoint. And Tom and I got back in touch and Tom took me out to coffee and I ended up at rock and that was it. And that's it. But point is, is like all this stuff was very gradual for me. You know, it was baby steps. I mean, I, I started at twelve fifty an hour as a tech. Yeah, I was eleven. Yeah, eleven bucks an hour. Mine might have been eleven fifty actually. But anyway, point is, is like there was no quick solution, right? There was no shortcuts. I gradually took baby steps, and you know, I ended up getting my. Uh, addiction certified i'm a certified addictions counselor through palm beach state college credit stuff and uh with the florida certification board all that i made a decision like i had intended on being a therapist but over the course of time being a tech and getting more into the operation stuff i I found i kind of enjoyed that more and kind of ditched you know i'm qualified enough to run groups and do a little bit of one-on-one stuff insurance doesn't think so from that end, but that's a whole nother discussion. But yeah. according to Florida laws, I can do one-on-one sessions, stuff like that. But, um, you know, it, it it's ended up organically just happening over, happening over the course of time and 12 years sobriety later, 10 years in the field, I'm at where I'm at today. There was no time machine that got me here. And I think that all the while too, and we got to wrap this up for the sake of time, our recovery stayed intact that whole entire time. There were no relapses. There were no slip ups, you know, aside from the, what we learned in the treatment, you know, starting to work in treatment and, you know, really working in every aspect of the, the, the treatment industry, we learned so much simultaneously, our recovery stayed intact. We have, we've had sponsors, we've had sponsees, we're still today active in our programs and, uh, you know, we've never wavered on that. And I think that's why we're in the position that we're in. So I would say that if you do, in fact, yourself or somebody that you know wants to work in addiction treatment for whatever reason, you got to take your time. You got to build your foundation first because if you have nothing to offer yourself in terms of sobriety and you haven't experienced and you haven't gone through those steps and you haven't done the work in my opinion you're not in a position to be working in treatment and even if said treatment center doesn't have a year requirement or a two-year requirement set that requirement for yourself don't worry about the money because our, honestly, you most treatment centers, they're not going to pay you anything more than what Target would pay you, you know, folding t-shirts, build your sobriety, build a foundation for yourself, go work at Target, go work at a, a grocery store, whatever the case is. And then when you have that solid foundation of sobriety, go and work in treatment. I think that's the only way to do it. You know, and you have because you have to have stuff to offer other people. And if you don't, then you're you're going to end up hurting more people than you are going to help. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I've also seen people shoot themselves in the foot as well. They get involved working in treatment super early. And this is literally true story. And I've seen it more than once. They've got like six months of sobriety. They're working at a detox and then they sleep with the client. And Department of Children and Families, who does the licensing, finds out 
Next thing you know, they're they're barred and they can no longer ever work in substance abuse or mental health again. So you have got to make sure that you are on firm footing with your principles, your morals, your ethics. And let's just call it what it is, Tom, in my opinion. I don't believe people in early recovery are ready for the responsibility of taking care of other people at a professional level. No, I agree. I agree. Well, listen, we hope that uh, you enjoyed this this episode. And, um, you know, in the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach out to us, Tom at realrecoverytalk.com and Ben at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see you all later.